When you're the president of the United States, I guess you have to do an interview every now and then. Joe should not be speaking in public. A disaster again. He went on the fake news today. They protected him, uh, but we could still see it. We could still see the dishonesty, the incompetence, the feebleness. Uh, really bad. And a major corporation gave him this opportunity. They have him on. Big live interview. And you, we all know that Hunter Biden, right, is under investigation. They have a crazy deal that's already been worked out. Shouldn't there be a question about the Department of Justice and what just happened? In a way, there was. To really focus on Trump and his innermost circle's role in the January 6th coup plot. You've awarded medals to Harry Dunn and Officer Fanon and the others. Do they deserve to know why it took the Justice Department a year to open an investigation into the person that incited the insurrection? That's it. January 6th, DOJ. They should have started the investigation earlier. What about the five-year investigation into Hunter Biden? What about the allegations of uh, that you were there on the couch with Hunter as he was shaking down the Chinese? The House Oversight Committee, they just figured this out. Care to comment, Mr. President? No, that's okay, because Joe, Hunter, protected by corporate America. NBC, Comcast, right? These are major, multinational, huge conglomerates. And they just gave the President of the United States a pass. What's happening here? This is like Twilight Zone territory. But anyway, I did glean some interesting things from this interview, despite their efforts. Take a look. I was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania, and I had a significant budget to hire a lot of people for the Biden democracy out there, from Tony Blinken and others who came along. He starts mumbling real quick. Oh, boy, why did I mention the Biden Penn Center, where all the classified documents were? With how much money? I was well-funded. $77 million came from China from January 2014 to June of 2020, huh? How about that? <laughs> what were they buying, huh? Next, please. And in that sense, it is, uh, it is not as embracing of, of all what I think the, con the Constitution says, we hold these truths, we sell that all men and women are created equal, endowed by their creator. It's a uniqueness of America. We never fully lived up to it. We never walked away from it. Uh, the thing is, that's what the Declaration of Independence says, not the Constitution. We have the Constitution, Declaration of Independence. They are two separate documents to serve two separate purposes. When you are the head of state, this country, you're supposed to know that stuff. You're supposed to leave it to me to correct him. Wow. Uh, and then there was this. This court seems to say that, no, that's not always the case. The idea there's no right of privacy in the Constitution, giving states power that we fought a war over in 1960. Yeah, he said it, 1960. He's 100 years off. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's amazing. That's a question they often, you know, American school children don't know history. Most don't know within 50 years what the Civil War, when the Civil War was fought. How about him? And then, oh, I mentioned the dishonesty. Yeah, these are horrible, sick lies. When the president of the United States, when that young woman was killed, a, stand, a, a bystander. Heather Hoyer, yeah. Yeah, and I talked to her mom. And he was asked, "Can you? what's happened down there? He said, there are very good people on both sides. Yeah. Very good people on both yeah. sides. Well, John Kelly's face told it all, right? Oh. <laughs> it said in his hands. Oh, I, but, I, but it did. But, yeah. Yeah, but think about what that said. <laughs> She's still laughing, kind of flirting more on her in a moment. This is a lie. This is the Charlottesville lie. He based his entire campaign on this. He based, I guess you could say, his entire presidency on a lie. The name is Heather Heyer, by the way. That's the young woman who was killed, not Hoyer. Anyway, this is what President Trump actually said. And you had people, and I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists, because they should be condemned totally. You had people... Very good on both sides. Now, he explicitly said not the white nationalists. Very good people on both sides. That means, you know what? You can be a very good person in America and be totally opposed to Confederate monuments. You can also be a very good person and say, you know what? This is part of our history and it should be preserved. That's a legitimate mainstream point of view. Both are. And Joe Biden lied in an effort to 
get power for himself. Now, did you notice the interviewer there? Just kind of, I mean, it was really flirtatious. This is very exciting for us. It's exciting for me. <laughs> you said today in another party, in yes. Another, well, I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> it's okay. It's You're getting a lot of trouble. <laughs> no, 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 but, but it, it is. The I optimist hope. could hope the so, optimist. right. John Kelly's face told it all, right? Oh. <laughs> his head in his hands. Oh, I, but, I, but it did, but yeah. yeah but. And then expanding that, that cadre to 40 countries. Yeah. <laughs> Finish your thought, Joe. That's Nicole Wallace, veteran of the George W. Bush White House, where her specialty, I believe, was and is making powerful men feel even more powerful. It's all about power. This individual um, has condemned the overturning of Roe v. Wade. She is holding a funeral for the death of affirmative action in colleges. They don't care about principle. It's all about power. And I think Joe thought this was a podcast at one point. Watch. I said I'd be a president for every American, whether they voted for me or not. Well, and, and the ones that didn't vote for your bills, but run on them. That's, That's right. <laughs> Mr. President, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very oh, much. I appreciate it's great it. to have you. It's thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Don't go anywhere. It's a very exciting day around here. Um, we'll have reaction. Uh, I've had first graders on this show who know to wait until the commercial break to get up and leave the room. Joe doesn't seem to know that. Wow. Anyway, other than that, other than those things, a great interview. Now this. This decision, let us be clear and not be deceived. It's, it's an attack on black people. What you're doing is you are limiting people's access to the American dream. This just shows the challenge facing our society. The legacy of centuries of racial discrimination is real. It is still with us. Wow. Talking about the uh, affirmative action decision. You heard about it by now. I think it's great. Uh, there will be some who will have to study harder to get into these elite institutions. That's not particularly popular with certain groups, but it passed six to three. And the media freakout has been pretty amazing. And to some groups, rather insulting. Take a look at this, how the New York Times characterized it all. Uh, this key line at the end, they really bemoan this. The decision will all but ensure that elite institutions become whiter and more Asian and less black and Latino. Whiter is a problem. More Asian, less black. Gosh, I hate looking at the world this way, don't you? Um, but the media, if you happen to be white on television, uh, you really, really, really had to make it out that you were offended by all of this. Specifically to you, sir, the African-American community in this country, you probably anticipated this was going to be a possibility, this ruling overturning affirmative action by the Supreme Court today. What has gone through your mind in terms of how you believe this will affect specifically the African-American community? Well, I think uh, that this is tantamount to sticking a dagger in our back. Yeah, that's Al Sharpton, who organized a boycott of Korean grocery stores in Brooklyn, this city, in the 1980s. He was resentful of their success. He's one of the most racist people you'll meet. And here he is on the fake news talking about uh, these issues. But it was the indignation of uh, a lot of the hosts today that was a little over the top. A lot of privileged kids are able to pay for tutors, tutoring, focusing on that kind of thing. Being able to afford tutoring so that you get a, a more comprehensive approach to your testing and will do better on those tests. If now applications into schools will be, be further dependent on those than before, that is an uneven playing field right there. And that's one incremental aspect. Just one. No more tutors. No more tutors for anybody. Uh, I have to hand it to Kenny Shu. He's a great guy. He's been on this case for a long time. He's from Color Us United. This great advocacy group points out that Asians have been getting the short end of the stick in all of this for a long time, and they certainly don't deserve that. I could point to race-based admissions as the reason why Asian Americans are being discriminated against right now. I mean, if you're an Asian American, you had to score 273 points higher on the SAT to have the same chance of admission as a black person to Harvard. Is that fair? 
I understand that people's lives are improved by getting into an Ivy League university, but that opportunity should be made available to people of every race, not just one. Do you worry about what this is going to do to the population now as these schools struggle to try and have a diverse student body? I don't understand why you think they're struggling. Do you not consider Asian Americans diverse? Of course. I consider Asian Americans diverse. Of course. That's what I'm okay. saying. When you look then at they some have of these a diverse student body. Good for you, Kenny Shu. Um, the Obamas had reaction. Uh, let's see. Michelle Obama put out a statement. And uh, yeah, they're trying to exploit this. Today, my heart breaks for any young person out there who's wondering what their future holds and what kind of chances will be open to them. That's right. Discourage them. Try to make them scared. And while I know the strength and grit that lies inside kids who had always had to sweat a little more to climb the same ladders, I hope and pray that the rest of us are willing to sweat a little too. All right. I'd like to go back to 2004. Remember that speech, that big speech that Barack Obama gave where he wanted people to like him and he wasn't really his honest self or, I don't know, his a version of himself. He said something that still I find pretty fascinating. And if it's true, and it probably is, this is the problem that needs to be addressed in America. Go into any inner city neighborhood and folks will tell you that government alone can't teach our kids to learn. They know that parents have to teach, that children can't achieve unless we raise their expectations and turn off the television sets and eradicate the slander that says a black youth with a book is acting white. They know those things. Did, did you hear that? A black kid with a, with a book is acting white? He said that. Is that a, a black youth with a book is acting white? Well, I haven't heard this addressed, have you? That's 2004, less than 20 years ago. Nothing has been done to eradicate this horrible slur. I think that's a big problem that no one's talking about. At one point, he had the bravery to, uh, to mention it. He won't even do that, let alone do anything to fix it. So I don't like affirmative action. I think we should go back, and apparently we will, to grades, extracurricular activities, maybe even a standardized test. And it shouldn't, be ba it shouldn't be based on what you look like, and it shouldn't be based on who your father is. You got that? The Biden family? Hunter Biden went to Yale Law School. Guess what? Bill Clinton made a phone call to the dean. That started the process that got Hunter into Yale Law School. Let's do away with that, please.